so about two months ago, I made this render right here and you guys really liked it and I personally fell in love with the piece. I even used it as a video thumbnail. But when I made a breakdown video for my Patreon, I had to go over how excruciating the process was of placing each and every one of these orbs along a curve and then stretching them over the surface and I was bashing my head against a wall thinking there has got to be a better way to do this. And thus a two month long adventure of me trying to figure out one of the weirdest add-ons I've ever discovered began. A tissue has definitely been featured on YouTube before. I'm definitely not the first person to use this, but there are so many different facets and features within tissue that I'm gonna to try to put all of the ones that I think are the most important together and kind of explain them simply. And then I'm gonna show you how to make this. So what exactly does tissue do? And that can be answered with kind of a simple answer, but also kind of complex, and that is tessellation. Google describes it as a tiling or pattern of a surface covering a plane, often involving geometric shapes. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a plane, and it doesn't necessarily have to be geometric shapes. The idea is that you are taking one shape, and then you are placing it for every single face you have of an object. Now you can see for when I was making those flowers why it would have been really helpful to have something like this. So let me show you a quick example of how this works, but first we're gonna go up to edit and then preferences. You're gonna type in tissue and you're gonna enable your add-on. You're gonna see here that I have two versions enabled and this is part of the weirdness Certain versions of this add-on do certain things because it's no longer being supported officially by Blender, or at least that's my understanding of it. But that is not something you need to worry about right now because the only version we're gonna be using in this video is already installed in Blender 3.5. So for this little demonstration, I'm just going to start off with a circle. I'm going to give it a face, inset it a little bit, and then extrude up. Something really simple like this, just like a little like top hat slash, uh, what are those guys, the, the barbershop quartet hats, just something like this, right? So with tissue enabled, right, we're going to click our little top hat shape, then we're going to shift click our cube. Now if we press N, it'll open up our side menu over here and we have all of these different options. And what we're gonna be focusing on right away is the tessellate option. And if you click that, it opens up another menu here and we're gonna leave everything default for the moment and just click okay. And now you can see that something has happened here we have this new shape. We have our top hat shape projected over the faces of our cube. And on the surface, why is that important, right? Why, why, why would I need that? This is a really, really easy way to get things like scales or brickwork. It's, it's a very simple way of getting something that ordinarily is very complex. Or at the very least, you have to know how to math and geometry nodes, and I don't know how to do any of that. But what I do know how to do is make a really, really bad segue to this video sponsor. Surfshark VPN. Now, unless you've been living completely internet free for the last decade, chances are you know what a VPN is. But if not, a VPN, virtual private network, by the way, allows you to browse the internet safely and more importantly, privately by covering up what you're doing online, keeping all of your precious personal information private and out of the hands of people who may want to steal it. This means anyone who may want to know what you're doing or where you're doing it from simply cannot. Online banking, paying your taxes, managing your business. These are all things we've come accustomed to doing from the comfort at our own homes. So why not do yourself the favor of staying safe online while you're staying comfy at home? Not only does Surfshark VPN keep you safe online, it also allows you to change your IP address at the tap of a finger. Meaning if you live in the UK, but your favorite TV show is only available on American Netflix, one simple change of your IP address can access a whole new world of entertainment. Or maybe you're sharing your device with your six-year-old who is really into Paw Patrol and 150 searches a day for Paw Patrol funny is certainly going to convince some websites that all you use the internet for is helping cartoon dogs fight fires. But with Surfshark VPN, you can easily conceal yourself while browsing online, guaranteeing truly organic results. So what are you waiting for? Get Surfshark VPN today at surfshark.deals forward slash addy. You can also use code addy for an exclusive offer and three extra months for free. Now with that out of the way, let's go ahead and cover some more things that this can do. This is a tessellation shape. You can see that it's been renamed tessellation up here. And what that means is that we can actually continue to work on this shape without involving our two original shapes. You might be a little bit confused about what that means. It's kind of a lot of information really quickly, but if you come over here to your object data properties panel, you can find out a little bit more really easy if you just drop down your tissue tessellation tab. Tissue tessellate. Tessellate is such a hard word. I'm going to mess this up a hundred times. So with that open, you're gonna see that we have our refresh tab here. We also have a bunch of different modes that we can try. And well, what are these modes? So quad is pretty obvious. Wherever there is a quad on your object, that's what's gonna to try to fill. Same thing for tries, if your tries are quads, whatever, right? But fan is an interesting 
same one. Now what this is doing is finding four verts on your plane, then taking your object and projecting from each vert inwards towards the center between them. Now next up is the patch mode, and I'm not exactly sure what this does. The end result is often very similar to quad, but sometimes you get slight differences in there, and I think it's just a little bit above my pay grade to understand the math that's going on in there. But if you're interested, I'm gonna leave a link to a video in the description where the creator of this add-on talks about all of the different things that the add-on contains. But there is one more. We do have our frame and framing, you guessed it, wherever the edges are, it creates a frame out of our initial shape, kind of like a wireframe. And with frame selected, you have a bunch more options to try to play around with all of this, and you can do that at your leisure. But for now, we're gonna stick with quad. Now, something else that you can find interesting is that this is not just limited to objects, you can also set this to collections and materials. But you might have noticed that when we were doing this initially with our circle, we were getting these weird gaps around our edges, and that is because our circle is not going to stretch perfectly to the shape of a quad, or at least it does its best not to. So how can we avoid that? Now, a very quick way around this is to do the same thing that we did with our little top hat setup, but to start with a plane and then bevel our corners. That way we are using a quad ended shape to project onto the quads of our main design, if that makes sense. Now there is a ton, ton more that this add-on can do. It's simply too much for me to go over all of it in one video. So I'm gonna be uploading a longer breakdown to my Patreon where I'm even gonna go over how I I made this weird like MoGraph cloth anim using this add-on. Like I said, it's really weird all the things that this add-on can do. So with all of that said and out of the way, let's go ahead and hop into how I made this render, which I used for the thumbnail of this video. So what I did is actually very simple. We've gone over a few times here. We're gonna spawn ourselves in a plane, go into edit mode. We're gonna inset our face, except this time we're gonna be a little bit more careful with it, kind of choose our decisions wisely. And by wisely, I just mean you wanna leave a little bit of space around the edges for our bevel. From there, it's just a repeat of what we've done a few times now. We are going to extrude up just a little bit, leave a little bit of breathing room in there, and then we are gonna select all of our corners of this extruded quad in edge select mode, and then we're gonna bevel them. However, be careful when you're choosing how detailed the bevel is, because this can get heavy very, very quickly. With that done, we're gonna select our top face. We're gonna inset again. Then we're going to extrude down something like this. Inset one more time and then extrude up so that we're just a little bit above the surface of our object. If we go into orthographic mode by pressing five and one on your numpad. You can see that we're just a little bit above it. And if you don't like the height, you can come in here and just kind of adjust it a little bit. Now with all of those selected, I'm going to do something that you do not have to do, but I'm going to do because I hate myself, I'm going to select all of our edges like these, and I'm going to bevel these because I really like the rounded look. However, as you can see, this is a lot of faces. So if we are spreading these all over an object, it's going to be heavier. You don't have to bevel that, but I'm going to. Also a good time to save your project if you haven't already. So let's go ahead and create the object that we are going to be tessellating onto. And how we're gonna do that is super easy. It's with an add-on called Add Extra Objects. It's already installed in Blender. So go ahead and turn that on. Then you are going to scroll down to Math Function and select XYZ Math Surface. Now right away, you're gonna see that you spawn with this kind of conch shell, which is in fact what I used for the thumbnail because I really, really like this shape. However, there are a ton of options here and some of them are important. So before clicking on anything, before adjusting scale, anything like that, open up this little menu on the side here and we're going to click off show wireframe because we don't want that. We can also tab out of edit mode if we want to with this. Uh, this just kind of helps you see the projection of your faces a little bit easier. But if you scroll up to the top, you can see operator presets. Now operator presets is just a bunch of preset projections of mathematical formulas into 3D space. So right now we have shell selected, right? And I don't know what the mathematical formula is for this, but if I were to click it, it gives it to me right here. Don't touch any of this unless you're way smarter than me, please. But if you do touch it, you can come up here and click restore operator presets and it brings all the math back. I, I did that a lot. So by clicking through here, you can see that there are a ton of shapes that you can select from. Most of them are super cool and unique that you just would not see in regular Blender. We're getting a lot of like really flat ones at the moment, but you, here you can see we have a Mobius strip, which is just a, a circle that gets flipped inside out. There are a bunch of them that are super unique shapes that you could definitely use for something like this. This, I, I can't explain what's going on here or how this is math in any way, but it's cool. But for now, let's go ahead and select our shell. We can tab out of this and we have everything selected. Tab out of edit mode and our wireframe goes away. That is important to uncheck wireframe because it will show in the render if you don't uncheck it. So let's go ahead and select our object, shift select our shell, come up into our tissue menu, 
and we're just gonna tessellate. We're gonna leave everything basic and just click OK. Now this might take a minute for you depending on how heavy you made your object, but this will be fairly dense, but you should still be pretty manageable. So I'm not gonna do too much tweaking of this shape. I'm pretty set with it and I'm pretty good to go. I spent a long time kind of picking and choosing what I like and what I don't like about this add-on and I'm pretty good to go with this one. However, if you're not 100% set in stone on this, this is where you should save a backup of this project file, not only because it's going to be useful to go back to it later on, but because we need it for the next step. And the next step is that we are going to delete these objects and then export as an FBX. Now you might be saying, why would, why would we do that? And that is because I haven't found a way around the fact that this stays as a tessellated object. There's no way to apply the add-on and just be done with it. This will always be running in the background. So any changes we make going forward, the tessellation has to be run first and then the effect can be put on top of that. Because of that, things can get very heavy very quickly and I found it's just easier to export it as an FBX. That will probably take a couple of minutes. Your computer's gonna get real mad at you for a second, but once it's exported, you should be good to go. Once you have it done, we're gonna go ahead and pull this into a new project file. We're gonna save this again. And from there, we are gonna go into edit mode because this is still fairly heavy and there's a good way of removing a lot of these vertices. So once we're in edit mode, you can see that there is a lot going on, but something you might not notice immediately is that if you come over here and you select a single vert, you click G to move it, again, it's going to be very heavy, but you'll see that none of these faces are connected. It's projecting all of the mesh together, but none of it is actually one mesh. It's a bunch of different meshes all together. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna hit A to select everything. Give it a second, it takes a little bit. Then we're gonna hit M and we are gonna merge by distance. Now you might've missed it, but there was a little message that popped up at the bottom of my screen for a second that said that it had removed thousands and thousands of vertices. That is so essential because it makes working in this project file a million times easier. So let's go ahead and start setting up our scene. We're gonna make ourselves a little camera here. We're gonna pull it back and we're just gonna start looking for an angle that we like that kind of matches our thumbnail angle a little bit. Uh, currently, I don't like our focal length. Let's go for something more like in 85, just to get it in a little bit more. Um, we're going to take it like this. We're going to open up a new window. We're going to rotate our guy here on our X axis, maybe on our Z. Maybe that's too much. We'll see. We're just trying to find a good positioning for it where we've got decent framing. Something that I always find helps me with my framing is to go into the viewport settings of my camera and turn my pass part out up to one. That way it blacks everything out. You can also turn off all of your overlays here. So we're gonna get some good positioning going on here. We're gonna leave a little bit of room in our top left just for some breakup. And overall, I think this is pretty solid framing. So we're gonna go ahead and make sure we are in cycles with GPU compute turned on. We're gonna turn our world level brightness all the way down to zero. And then we are gonna spawn ourselves in some lights. Now we're gonna start with a very basic setup that I do for most projects, which is one light on the top and then one light on the side. And I start looking for gaps. This is not always the best lighting setup. There is no best lighting setup. There is no definitive lighting setup. Anybody that tells you that is an idiot. There is specific lights for specific scenes, but you can form good habits and find good ways to fill lights by starting with something familiar. This happens to be familiar to me and it works really well for product lighting or for lighting a singular object in a scene, which for my YouTube tutorials, I tend to do a lot. So right now, what I can tell you is that we have some pretty soft lighting going on with some harsher spots, which is pretty similar to what we've done in our thumbnail. And I do like it, I think it's a good start. But something that I think that this needs is a little bit of backlighting on this far edge over here. I think that if this is further lit up, that we might get some better separation once we add in our background, which at this point I think we can do now. We're just gonna add ourselves in a plane, rotate it on our X axis and scale it up and then move it behind our object. Now you might have to reposition this a little bit so that it kind of fits your scene a little bit more. We're gonna go ahead and steal one of these lights and duplicate it, move it up and over. We're going to angle it at our scene here but we're going to move it in a little bit because we want a little bit of a vignette in this corner. That way we have dark down here, dark up here, light in the center, and we're going from dark to light towards the top of our screen. Now this might be a lot of information, but to kind of compact it quickly, we are guiding our eye lines up through our project, but we want a specific focus. I'm gonna do a little bit more repositioning because I think we could fill our frame just a little bit better here. Get something also a little bit more similar to our thumbnail. I think that's really solid actually. I think that that might be better framing than the thumbnail. Now, I think our side over here is a little bit too dark. Now I definitely think it's too bright, but I think that if we were to take a light way off in the distance, 
and kind of angle it just a little bit away from our object here. We might get a little bit better lighting going on. We also might be able to push it further in the back to get some kind of fake backlighting going on. And even though it isn't really real to our scene, it kind of looks nice. It also kind of interrupts our guiding our eye line up into this corner a little bit more. But like I said, lighting is subjective. Rules are there and fuck them. So let's go ahead and work on some materials. I think our basic lighting setup is good enough for now. You might want to spend a bit more time playing with it. I know that I certainly did. I Once I finally landed on this project, I spent like four or five days working on lighting and colors till I found something that I liked. For this one, I want to go a little bit more into our greens than I did for the thumbnail. So we're choosing this light blue color. Our hex code is available there. Now that's just for our background, something very simple just to get the job done. We're going to go ahead and add a new material to our shell. And you might notice at this point that things are getting a little bit heavy as we're adding materials to this. So you can go ahead and switch over into material view. There really isn't much need to view the base material at this point in time. And what I did with this material is something that I do very, very often. Often, which is mixing two principal BSDFs together via a noise texture. It is just a super easy way of getting speckles within your shape and kind of getting some breakup of colors without really having to do any work. And I'm all about not having to do more work. So with a simple setup like this, we're gonna change one of our colors to black, and then we're gonna move our color ramp in until we can see where they start to interact. There you go. And now for mine, I cranked the scaling way up and I did this kind of like, uh, maybe not Dalmatian kind of effect, but salt and pepper maybe you would try to put it, something like this. And what I did is I didn't actually go black, I went for a very dark brown. Something within this range is what I went for before. And now our main color, I'm thinking, I don't know what I'm thinking, honestly. Do I ever? Maybe somewhere around here. I kind of really like the way that that looks, but you guys know me, I do this all the time. I love Subsurf. So we're gonna put up just a tiny, tiny little bit of it. I'm also thinking there's maybe too much speckle going on. Definitely a little bit more than what was in the final render that I showed you guys. So maybe something like this works a little bit better. And now something else that we can do is if we take the output from our color ramp, we can plug that into a bump node back here into our height. And then our bump can go into both of the normals for our principal BSDFs. And it gives us this fake kind of breakup. So that way the breakup in our texture isn't just breakup in color. It also looks like breakup in height, which kind of gives a little bit more of a, a realistic feel to our object. You can play with the strength of this if you want. I think right now maybe it's a little bit high. Maybe something like 0.8 is a little bit better. From this point onward, I duplicated the speckle effect once more, adding a metal material in there just so there's a little bit of shine. I also did that in our thumbnail. And then I play with my lighting a little bit more, play with my framing a little bit more, just to get kind of a better overall feel for everything. And then with all of that done, this is what we're left with. I think the material on this could use a little bit more love in just deciding where these speckles are placed. I still think it's a little bit noisy and I couldn't quite reach a spot where I felt like it was ready, but I also feel like it's good enough. And sometimes that's how it is. It's just gotta be good enough. Not everything's got to be perfect, you know? That being said, that is it for the tutorial and the add-on for today. But I do have a couple of things that I want to say about the Patreon. So if you are a patron and want to know about that, uh, stick around. A few people have contacted me asking about lessons like private tutoring or consulting work. And I don't really have the time for it, but I am my own boss at my job, so I can take time off. So I added a tier for consulting and yes, it is very expensive. No, I don't expect any of you to pay for it. This has been up for a month and zero people have bought it and maybe it should stay that way. But I want to put this up. that This isn't just me being like, hey, subscribers, give me, give me you fucking money. That's not it at all. This is only because I don't have a way of doing this yet and people keep asking about it. So I put up my day rate and just said, if people want it, they can buy it. If not, that's totally fine. I just wanted to give an explanation on it because I felt like adding $150 tier to your Patreon is kind of insane without saying anything. It might be still kind of insane. I don't know. I'm testing it out. We'll see how it goes. If nobody buys it, I'll remove it. I'm not dependent on that money and I will never demand anything from you guys ever. That being said, thank you for watching this video all the way through. Thank you to my patrons for continuing to support me. I've said that a whole bunch at this point, but thank you. I really do mean it. And I will see you guys again real soon.